This meeting is now being recorded. Good morning, everyone. This is Ren Hayhurst from Brian Cave. I'm very grateful for meeting. everybody taking the time to Welcome. join us wherever you're Joining located. The meeting. For some of you, I know it's lunchtime or later. For us out here on the West Coast, it's in the morning. But in either event, uh, I appreciate these opportunities Joining the meeting. to share some information with uh, members of your bank. As a brief overview, again, uh, let me just uh, give meeting. you a little bit uh, of perspective. Rogers from Religious Planning Division. Joining the meeting. <laughs> Tony Mann. Still joining. Um, let me give you a little bit joining of perspective on my background the because meeting. it colors how I look at transactions and how I advise clients on transactions. Uh, today's subject joining is the meeting. we're going to look John at Groucho. joining the meeting more complex Michael loan Ball. structures, ones that involved mixed collateral. By mixed, I'm talking about both personal and real property collateral, or collateral that is located in multiple jurisdictions. How you deal with uh, management of that collateral, uh, enforcement of remedies on that collateral and choice of law issues to contemplate to be able to put yourself in the best position uh, in terms of exercising any rights vis-a-vis -vis that collateral. Joining the meeting. I was a 10-year trial attorney for financial institutions at the start of my career. So during this most recent downturn, Joining the meeting. even though I've been a transactional lawyer for the last 15 plus years, uh, I did spend a lot of time overseeing our restructure and workout group and their interactions with many of our clients because I firmly believe that when you enter into a loan transaction, that is a, a, a transaction where you and your borrower share business goals, some of which align and some of which diverge a bit. Uh, when there's a distressed asset, when the collateral is at risk, uh, you still have a business objective. And I try to always keep that in mind, both in the way we structure our transactions and then the way we advise the enforcement of remedies against uh, collateral pledged for those transactions. Because at the end of the day, you're going to be measured by how well of a business decision you made. And I think our highest and best use in this situation is to put you in a position where you have business alternatives, where you have flexibility in terms of what you can pursue, where you have a range of options, and then when it comes time to take action, you can either take a measured approach or you can take an all-in approach but I am not in favor of structuring complex transactions where it works like a toggle switch. And in my mind, when I think of toggle switch, I think of the old Frankenstein movie where the doctor Join pulls that meeting. giant electric handle and sparks fly and the monster is, is shocked with electricity. Uh, that's typically what you'll find in most transactions. That toggle switch is declaring a default, and starting foreclosure or other remedies against collateral. If that is your only choice to deal with a distressed asset or a difficult situation, in my opinion, uh, we can and should be doing better. We should give you more options. So today, I do want to spend some time talking about these types of loan structures, but with an eye towards discussing options that you have in terms of structure and how that gives you flexibility when you have to deal with difficult situations that involve either the business operations of your borrower or that impact uh, the collateral itself. If it's, if it's being damaged, if it's at risk, if it's otherwise um, uh, suffering uh, some threat that you'll be able to protect Joining your the interest therein. So skipping ahead, 
as I look into this year and I see the transactions that we've been doing and as I talk to lenders such as yourself, there are a couple of things that, that are really leaping out to me. One is the increased proliferation of multiple property, multiple jurisdictional transactions. And one of the reasons we see that is after the latest recession, the survivors, the strong operators, they've been able to expand their portfolios, they've been able to pick up additional assets, they've been able to qualify for more interesting uh, and more profitable for banks, restructure opportunities, but very often those involve uh, multiple properties so that there's adequate collateral protection. In addition, a lot of these operators have successfully expanded into different jurisdictions. And sometimes that can mean, and it can make a difference, literally county by county within a state, but more typically when I say multiple jurisdiction, I'm talking about assets located in different states. Also, we're seeing uh, more mixed collateral situations. And by mixed collateral, what I'm talking about primarily is where you're taking uh, some interest in a real estate asset. Now, that could be uh, a deed of trust. It could be um, a leasehold assignment or a leasehold deed of trust. Or it could be a pledge of proceeds, rents, etc from a particular property. That will also be in addition to, let's say, a general UCC filing or other type of pledge of accounts or assets of a particular borrower. And this mixture and how you document and how you operate between the two types of collateral can either in some instances limit you or it can give you increased flexibility. We're also seeing a, a, a real trend in what I call flexibility or alternative forms of subordinate debt in terms of structured lending. So for example, uh, what, the, what the classic type of subordinate debt is, you have a senior lender, which typically would be a bank like yourself. You may have an equity investor who is making a mezzanine loan and that loan can be secured by a pledge of the ownership interest in the entity or other types of, of non-real estate collateral. And sometimes you do get a second lien on the property. What we're seeing uh, nowadays in terms of, of these kind of structures is we're, we're seeing a, a continued movement towards AB note structures Joining where – a single lender will make an integrated loan with an A note and a B note with the intent of perhaps selling the B piece. Or we're seeing something that maybe you guys are hearing more and more about, and that's Unitranche deals. Now, a Unitranche deal is really a misnomer, and it's, it's causing a lot of audit angst for the FDIC. Uh, a, a Unitranche deal is really just a syndicated deal where you're using a single note instead of multiple notes and you're building in a priority of repayment for certain lenders vis-a-vis -vis other lenders. For example, uh, a non-bank will go out and arrange for CMI financing for a company, but they can't hold the entire debt. And so they want to lure a bank into being their partner, but the bank uh, ordinarily would not have done the deal, uh, either because maybe it's an unknown company or it's a bit of a startup company. So the bank will go into the deal as a syndicate partner in a unit tranche, but they'll be uh, last money in, first money out, and they'll have a built-in structural subordination. So we're seeing a lot of those types of transactions, and if properly documented, they're great Join investment the vehicles, and, well, and they I'm provide sorry. a lot. They provide a lot of flexibility and a lot of options uh, for banks coming into those type of transactions. Uh, as I said, we'll talk a little bit about protecting remedies. And the bottom line is, I want to create a sense 
that within reason, when you're looking at these types of complex structured deals, you can have your cake and eat it too. Meaning you can structure a deal that will be competitive and attractive to your borrower and will create new business for you and the bank and at the same time can be documented and administered in a way that will walk and talk more like the safe, secure, traditional types of deals that you would otherwise do as a banking and a regulated institution. Um, as I move from slide to slide, I will take a brief pause. The purpose is if somebody does have a question as I finish the subject, you're certainly invited to ask the question before I move forward. Joining because the I appreciate the meeting. questions that come up as we move through the discussion because probably other people ha are having a similar Joining inquiry. The meeting. Joining the meeting. Joining the meeting. Joining the meeting. Joining wow. the meeting. Have, have a Joining, lot of the meeting. Here. <laughs> Joining the meeting. Got disconnection. Joining the oh, meeting. Okay. <laughs> Joining okay. the meeting. Joining the meeting. Joining uh, the meeting. I'm gonna give thirty Joining seconds the to let them come on. Joining the meeting. All right, I think we got through our rush. Welcome back, disconnected people. Disconnected, Joining but the meeting. hopefully not just a fact. Welcome back, John. Sorry um, I cut off, Ren. Joining the meeting. No, that's, that's okay. We had a lot of people accidentally drop off. So I, I, I'm getting into the meat of the matter now, which is the multiple collateral situations. And let me give you a couple of different ideas of what I'm talking about in this instance. I want to talk about when you have multiple security instruments on separate properties. Joining the so meeting. So one instance could be where you have a single note that's secured by multiple deeds of trust. Those deeds of trust uh, can be in meeting. different counties, and sometimes those counties will have different recording requirements, um, or they can be located in completely different states. I do want to spend some time at the end and talk a little bit about the issue of choice of law, because I think it's important for everybody who's underwriting a deal to consider up front where they're making the deal, where their borrower's located, where their collateral's located, and if that combination creates some type of an advantage that would assist the lender in exercising remedies. Let me give you a, a, just a very quick example. We recently had a transaction where we had both the borrower and the lender making the loan out of their California offices. California law could have easily applied. But the collateral consisted of a business and the underlying real estate in Texas. So there was a general security agreement uh, for a general UCC pledge. There was a pledge of accounts receivable and a variety of other uh, typical Join type the CNI collateral as well as there was a first lien deed of trust on the realty. Texas is a very lender-friendly state in terms of remedies. If you want to exercise a power of sale under a deed of trust, if you time it right, you can, from beginning to end, complete it in 20 days. In addition, Texas courts are not very sympathetic to borrowers, and they tend to enforce documents as they are written. They don't have a one action rule in Texas and they don't have some of the limitations that we have here in California. So even though we had a California lender, California based lender, California based borrower, we agreed on our side that Texas law would be the proper choice. And I'll go into this a little bit further, but it gets a little more complicated when you have assets in a variety of, of jurisdictions because one rule to remember is, is that regardless of what your choice of law is, procedurally, your security instruments, whether it is a UCC pledge or whether it is a deed of trust, 
will be controlled procedurally by the law of where the collateral is located. That's the general rule. So if you have a, uh, a pledge of real estate in Texas, you might choose California as the controlling law for the interpretation of the loan documents. But to complete a foreclosure in Texas, you would have to follow the Texas procedures. So there are times where you can also mix and match your choice of law with your procedural requirements and get the best of both worlds. The key is, in a single note or even a multiple note situation where you have multiple collateral instruments, whether those are deeds of trust or security agreements or pledges of accounts, uh, et cetera. What the best option is, in my opinion, is to make sure that all of your security agreements allow you to conduct what I would term serial or individual foreclosures, as well as a combined or unified foreclosure at the lender's discretion so that you can yield the best recovery based on the situation. I'll give you an example. Have a note secured by a construction facility that makes wire hangers one of only two companies in the United States that still make wire hangers in this country. They have some very valuable equipment located in Tennessee and Wisconsin. They have some very unvaluable real estate in both of those jurisdictions. There is a very active market on the security interest in the equipment. There are some Chinese manufacturers that would very much like to buy this equipment because the Chinese have really dominated this market. We created security agreements that were separate for the various types of collateral that allowed the lender to do a unified sale or separate sales of either and or any combination of the real estate and the personal property. What we ended up doing in this instance is, without waiving any of our debt, we were able to complete uh, private auction sales under the UCC of all of the equipment and recover enough to pay the debt so that we did not have to foreclose and be stuck with these plant facilities which were not only in, in tough locations in terms of resale Join market, meeting. but potentially had environmental Keep issues up. because of the work that had been done on those sites. So we were able to sell the personal property, have it hauled away by the purchaser, and be able to make ourselves whole without having to foreclose on the real estate. That's an example of trying to give yourself every option available. Now, we did consider trying to sell in a unified basis, and we did conduct an auction process for a single bidder to come in and buy both plants with the real estate and the equipment, because we were originally advised by an appraiser that that would get the highest price. Nobody wanted the real estate. So the prices that we were getting offered were considerably lower than what individuals were privately coming up and telling the bank they would pay for just the equipment alone. So we were able to change course. That's an example of setting yourself up when you have multiple uh, collateral uh, as part of your security package. Another situation is the AB note structure. And the whole purpose of an A and a B note is simply to create a primary or a senior obligation that is given primacy in terms of repayment and collateral protection. And the B piece is obviously the higher risk because it is subordinated 
Uh, it is usually for a higher yield because it is the first loss position. Uh, and typically, these notes are, are able to be sold on the market. And so the maker of, a, of an AB note structure typically does so because they have a potential buyer for the B piece. In these situations, you want to be careful on how you structure the notes when you have multiple collateral so that you correctly identify cross-default situations, cross-collateral situations, and most importantly, because I'm not talking about CMBS-style loans where you have REITs that are holding these assets, in the typical bank scenario, you want the holder of the A piece, which is usually you, the bank, the maker of the loan, to have control pursuant to an intercreditor agreement to direct how the remedies are going to be exercised and to not have a fiduciary obligation to the holder of the B piece. Now, you have to be careful because you have to exercise your remedies under the implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing in many jurisdictions. But that is a far easier test that is subject more to standards like the business judgment rule, meaning are you exercising rational business judgment, as opposed to putting you in a duty position where you're obligated to protect the holder of that B piece, at least equal to your interest or perhaps even senior to your interest. And so you want to be very careful when you're creating your security interests, that you're creating single instruments, but that you're building in structural subordination and you're giving the right of election of remedies and exercise of remedies to the holder of the AP, which will typically be you, the bank. And if those are clearly spelled out, there's a long line of bankruptcy case authority that supports both the enforcement of subordination provisions between lenders if your borrower uh, falls into bankruptcy or goes into bankruptcy, and it also protects the rights if you, if you build in the subordination provisions and give bankruptcy protections to that senior lender to be able to direct the enforcement of remedies through the um, bankruptcy proceeding, including voting interests, uh, making release stay motions, objection, objecting to disclosure statements and plans of reorganization, et cetera. You can have those rights appropriately delegated to the senior lender in these structures to protect them in a way that's consistent with the original intent. But you must be very specific and you must be very detailed because whatever you leave out will assume, the courts will assume were not intended to be granted to the senior lender. Moving on to where you have multiple security instruments on a single property. This is where you may have multiple notes, an A note and a B note, and you're thinking to yourself, well, what I'll do is I'll, I'll put a, a first lien to secure the, the senior loan, and I'll put a second lien uh, to secure the junior loan. Generally, we advise against that structure. And here are a couple of reasons why. One is, in many jurisdictions, including your jurisdictions west of the Mississippi, and even more specifically, Colorado West, there are case law findings that if you are the holder of the senior and of the junior piece, and you foreclose just on your senior piece, you cannot make yourself a sold-out junior that then has an unsecured right where you can sue on guarantees or against your borrower. 
as a free unsecured lender. Uh, you are considered to wipe yourself out if you are foreclosing and you do not get the rights that a third party junior lender would have of being a sold out junior because you're in control of the remedy process. In addition, if you say to yourself, well, maybe what I'll do is I'll foreclose against the junior because that's the first riff piece and I'll keep the senior on and see if we can work out some type of resolution by selling the debt or selling the property to someone who will, will pay off the debt. That typically doesn't work either because when you foreclose on the B piece, you're subject to something called merger of title. And even though you can build into your documents a provision that says, if I'm foreclosing on a junior interest, that does not extinguish my senior interest. Except for the deed and loose scenario where that happens, many courts have held that there is in fact a merger and you therefore wipe out your first lien and your first lien debt. So what you end up doing is you end up doing a unified sale and foreclosing on both notes and then just prioritizing how you distribute the proceeds. And if you come up short on the B piece of the loan, then you have a true deficiency claim and you can go pursue that under state law versus your, your borrower or your guarantors. And so our advice is it really becomes confusing and problematic to create the first and second lien and you can accomplish everything you want to with a single security instrument that secures both obligations and then properly prioritizes and subordinates the various interests so that you can have your cake and eat it too without the potential risks that I've just described. So if you do come across a situation where you're contemplating, even in a restructure, and you're being offered the chance to make an additional advance that maybe you want to evidence by a separate note, and you want to take a second lien, we would advise that it would be best to amend your existing deed of trust or amend your existing security agreement to secure both notes and then within that security instrument, provide for the subordination and priority provisions to give you maximum flexibility, avoid the pitfalls that I've described, and be able to enjoy the potential of a full recovery, either through your collateral and or seeking a deficiency against a guarantor or other third party obligor. Um, this is where I put in uh, and have changed this program a, a bit to mention the Unitronch situations because a Unitronch is, is simply, as I've described before, it's a loan that's typically arranged by a non-bank lender. These deals usually are for developing companies that are expanding. They're past the uh, startup phase, but they're in the expansion mode, so they need additional working capital they're willing to give a general UCC pledge, and they're willing to enter into a strict cash management arrangement so that the lenders can protect themselves by making sure that all income from the operations runs through a pledged account and is applied pre-default and post-default according to very strict waterfall provisions. So these are deals that can be very attractive if you're a bank coming in and typically the non-bank lenders who promote and arrange these deals are willing to give a senior interest to the bank that comes in and buys a part of these deals. They're willing to enter into an intercreditor where they will grant senior rights both to enforcement and recovery and they'll give you essentially a first dollar out guarantee in the way they structure the deal. These deals can be attractive and they can be highly profitable. My caution to you is make sure that you consult with your counsel if you're looking at one of these deals. 
because this is an emerging area where the promoters of this business, from a business standpoint, know what they're willing to give away, but from a legal standpoint, their documents have not quite caught up to what they're promising. I'm not suggesting that they're doing anything uh, with a bait-and-switch motive. In fact, I've, I've closed probably half dozen Unitronch deals already the first quarter of this year, year, and I've never run across a promoter of these deals that wasn't completely sincere in offering the business deal that they had promised the bank. They simply did not have documents which matched up with that business deal, and we had to do some corrective drafting to make sure that the priority was maintained in a pre-default situation, a post-default situation. It gave rights of approval of consent after default for the senior position, and it also gave certain bankruptcy protections to the holder of the senior position in a Unitronch deal. So it wasn't a matter of them promising A and delivering B intentionally, but there is still work to be done in making sure that the protections that you think you're getting are accurately reflected in the documents as this industry really picks up speed and starts to develop. I also want to talk about mixed collateral situations with real and personal property liens. And again, your strategy is you want to preserve the right to do either a combined sale or separate enforcement. And believe it or not, it is possible in every jurisdiction, even California, where if you have a single mortgage or deed of trust, on multiple lots or multiple parcels of real property, you can include a provision that even allows you to foreclose individually on those parcels or on those properties under that single security instrument without waiving your deed of trust unless and until you're paid in full. So I'm talking about not just giving you the right to go after uh, uh, personal property collateral separate from real property collateral. You can also structure your deal where if you have multiple uh, properties, let's say in a manufacturing facility where they have their manufacturing plant and then they have a distribution center and then they might even have an equipment uh, lot for their, for their uh, property, you can easily take a single deed of trust if all those properties are in one county and build in a provision where you can foreclose individually at your discretion and in your order for maximum recovery against those various properties. And if, for example, you deem that the equipment Lot uh, may have some environmental issues, you could foreclose first against the other two parcels, complete your foreclosure under the UCC of the personal property piece, and then see where you are in terms of recovery and what you want to do with that third piece of property where you may have some environmental concerns. Now, that doesn't dim diminish that there are very often instances where a unified sales approach is going to yield the best result. I recently had to foreclose on an alternative energy plant. And in this particular instance, the location and the physical layout of the property was crucial for the operation of this biomass plant and so the equipment was worth far less if it didn't come with the real estate. There was a ground lease that we had taken a leasehold deed of trust, and we did a unified sale. And we realized a much higher yield, upwards of 20% greater price than if we had done a bifurcated sale. I've had exactly the opposite with a biomass plant where nobody wanted to touch the real estate because of environmental concerns and the equipment was easily mobile in this instance. So we sold the equipment uh, and, and, and used that as our recovery. So the point being here 
is that if you document these very specifically, you can give yourself a variety of options. And I'm not here to say that one option is always the best way to go. The only thing I'm here to say is if you don't create these options, you're almost certainly going to be limited in a way that probably does not work to your favor when the economy changes because we're not able to predict where the economy is going to go in those instances. So you want to be very careful and you want to make sure that you're enforcing for your multiple sales that you're doing so in a way that complies with the local procedural provisions as well as your choice of law provisions. And this is an example, for instance, where you may choose if you have a lot of California-based collateral, but let's say you have a Colorado company and maybe even you have a Colorado office that uh, initiated the loan, you may want to choose as your controlling law Colorado. In your California forms of deed of trust, you can do these serial sales, but you can do them by trustee sale, multiple trustee sales, and still preserve all of your deficiency rights against your borrower and your guarantors under Colorado law. And this approach has been upheld by not only federal courts and state courts in California, but also under bankruptcy rulings. So that's another instance where choice of law can not only create options, but give you opportunities that you may not have thought existed when you looked at the initial transaction. Switching slides to multiple collateral part 2C. Um, in this instance, I, I think what I do want to highlight is we spend a lot of time talking about what you can do in a variety of states, and I've made a point to highlight how you can work around the one action rule if you have real estate. Here's an important point that I want to make at this juncture. If you are structuring your deal, and your deal in your mind is an ABL transaction, or it's a CNI transaction, and your primary source of repayment is going to be the cash flow from the operations, it's going to be the receivables, it's going to be the equipment and the inventory of the company and you decide that you're going to take an abundance of caution deed of trust on the real estate. It's perfectly fine to do that. But in every state that has a one action rule, California, Washington, Nevada, Utah, Idaho now has a, a version, a watered down version as it were, of a one action rule, as does Oregon. Uh, in each of those states, um, it is important to note that as soon as you take that deed of trust, even though you may not be giving it any kind of underwriting significance, you have converted your entire transaction to a real estate secured transaction in these various states, meaning that every decision you make is going to have to be in compliance with the anti-deficiency and the one action rule protections that exist in those states. Now, can you waive those in guarantees? Yes. Can you still conduct your serial foreclosures that we've talked about? Yes. Can you take certain types of non-real estate assets as collateral, such as a letter of credit, uh, and other types of personal property collateral and realize on that personal property before you exercise your rights against the real estate? The answer is yes. But it is a bit of a minefield. You do need a strategy up front because the court, no matter how insignificant that real estate is to your underwriting, once you've added real estate to the mix, you've made a real estate secured loan. 
And so one of the things that we kind of grimace at in our office is where we see underwriting and we can clearly see that all the value is in the non-real estate assets. And the lender in good faith wants to tie up their borrower so they take an abundance of caution, first lien or even second lien, let's say, on their real estate. And they do so so that they can justifiably say, we've really got our arms around this company. In those instances, if we're involved, you can at least expect a phone call from us where we will discuss with you if this is truly how you want to proceed and what some of the limitations may be. Because we've had situations where we've most definitely advised against throwing out the real estate collateral because in some instances it's been a third or fourth lien where there's no value whatsoever. But taking that lien would completely transmute the deal from being a nice, tight, general UCC secured loan and made it a real estate loan subject to all of the burdens that come with a real estate loan in the various states that I'm talking about. Now, you don't have these problems in Texas. You don't have these problems in Colorado, in Illinois, in Missouri. Um, there are many, many jurisdictions where you don't have to worry about this. But I do know that you guys are very active in a number of these states, so I do want to make you sensitive to this aspect of your underwriting. And if you're looking at it, please give us a call a five-minute conversation, we're not going to open up a matter, we're not going to bill you, and we're happy to walk through and think it through and help you decide if that real estate is really something that you need and want, or if there is a way, even by, let's say, recording a negative pledge on the real estate, where you can protect yourself against having that property sold out from under you, uh, so that you can maintain control over the operations of the company, but you don't put yourself in a position where you have a real estate lien that changes the very nature of the loan you're intending to make. I, was, I want to spend a moment and distinguish between cross-default and cross-collateral, and I want to make sure that you understand some of the issues that you need to address. Now, cross default simply means the occurrence of a default under one credit facility will trigger a default under a second or third credit facility. It does not control any remedies. It does not provide access in and of itself to the respective collateral for the various loans. It is simply an event of default. And all it does is create a basis under which a lender can trigger a default to protect its interest. So sometimes it makes a lot of sense. If you have a borrower that, that is part of a, a network of, of families and perhaps their guarantor has given a number of guarantees such that they're spread pretty thin, it would not be unusual to perhaps seek across default if there's any kind of action brought for a breach of any guarantees against that guarantor on other transactions. But it will not give you access to collateral, to collateral that's been pledged for those other loans. For that, you need not only a cross-collateral provision, which is something in your document saying this loan is secured by both X collateral and Y collateral. You actually need to build that into the security instruments yourself. And again, this is an instance where you have that situation where you may be debating should I have a first and a second lien, or should I combine the liens uh, to achieve my cross-collateralization and then prioritize my recovery? Give you an example. You have an existing lien 
for a particular piece of property and you have and, and that lien is performing and you have excess value in that property and everything is very good with loan A. Loan B is struggling. The property is an income producing property. It's lost tenants. Uh, you, you're struggling with the repayment. You want to restructure the loan. You want to give a little bit of a break on loan B. In return, you're going to be paid some fees and you're going to get a cross collateralization with loan A, meaning you're going to get some of that umbrella coverage of the excess value for property A to help secure and bolster property B. You're going to already have note A and you're going to have note B. The question is, do you in that instance for the cross collateralization record a second on each of the respective properties cross collateralizing so that you have a first and a second on property A and on property B or do you amend your original mortgages or deeds of trust to provide for the cross collateralization the seniority and subordination provisions and give yourself the type of flexibility that we described above clearly our advice would be to go the latter route that there really aren't advantages to having a first and second in your favor on respective properties. And in fact, there are potential pitfalls that arise when you exercise your remedies that you can easily address, maintain all of the rights you want to protect by an appropriate amendment. In talking about cross default provisions and cross collateral provisions, the law in various states which have enforced cross-default provisions seems to have followed a very clear pattern. And this is clear both in state court rulings that we've reviewed, federal court rulings that have, been, that have applied state law, and bankruptcy court rulings that have looked through state law through the unique prism of bankruptcy remedies. And the trend very clearly is, is that if you're intending to cross default loan A with loan B, a catch-all provision that is thrown into the loan documents that says, oh, and by the way, any other loan that you ever may do in any other capacity with any other related entity is always going to be cross defaulted with this loan forever and ever. Amen. Those catch-all provisions have been struck down. Those catch-all provisions are exactly what you get with Laser Pro or with other automated documents. If you want an enforceable cross-default provision, your best position is to recite a cross-default provision that says, we are intending to default loan A with loan B, which means if one loan goes into default, that triggers a default in the other, and vice versa, and you lay that out. There's strong case law that supports the value of those cross-default and enforces those cross-default provisions. And I can tell you, whether it's a real estate secured loan or a personal property secured loan, if you have these specific cross-default provisions and you start getting rumblings from your borrower that, well, your cross default provision really isn't enforceable and they throw at you some case law, I will bet you that every bit of case law they throw you will be on one of these generic provisions that come from a preprinted form and that we can find equally strong and definitive rulings in your favor when the cross default provisions are specific. And so we want to make sure to do that for you. In addition, if you have a family of companies that are benefiting from common ownership and you want to cross default loan A, collateral A with loan B and collateral B, but you have two sister companies that are under common ownership and are, are sharing in, in a family uh, of companies that benefit from each other's success, 
if you are going to be cross-defaulting and cross-collateralizing, we advise, again, whether it's personal property security or real property security, that you add in what's called the third-party accommodator provisions when you amend your security instruments. And all that means is, is for loan A, if you're cross-defaulting and cross-collateralizing with loan B, you want to make sure to have the sister company for loan B sign your amendment documents for loan A and include in their provisions which say they know they're pledging and that they have an economic interest with the borrower in loan A and that they have a relationship whereby they're economically advantaged by both companies having their respective loans and therefore they are willing to pledge their interest and cross default and cross collateralize these two loans without becoming a guarantor but becoming a, a pledgeor of additional collateral and additional financial strength for each of the respective loans. And you should do that for your restructures or your initial documentation for both loans when you're setting it up this way. Because again, if you add in that very specific language, that will be enforced. But if you don't include it, you are leaving yourselves at least open to a challenge that there hasn't been given sufficient um, consideration, that you have a fraudulent conveyance, that there wasn't good value given, et cetera. And so uh, one of the things that we pay a lot of attention to, particularly now that we've gone through this latest recession and seen how bankruptcy courts have behaved, we uh, have gotten through the initial scary bankruptcy rulings that made it look like sister and affiliated companies could not cross default and cross collateralize respective loans. We've gotten to the point where if, if there's common benefit that is derived because of their organizational structure, you can in fact cross default and cross collateralize and those early rulings were overturned but the lesson that came out of it is our documents need to be very specific in including these types of third-party accommodator type provisions where you would deal up front with the consideration issues, with the consent issues, and that you have sophisticated companies acknowledging that they're entering into complex, sophisticated commercial transactions and in that instance, you will get the court's attention and they will typically enforce those documents as written. So want to be very clear on that is you have, notwithstanding some of the early scary rulings, we are back in a position where we can advise that if you look at an organizational chart and can draw lines showing that economic benefit ultimately reaches, even if it's indirectly, affiliated or related companies, then you can have those entities as guarantors, third-party accommodators, or other type involved parties. I will caution you on this, though. If you have a very complex organizational chart and they're looking, your borrower is offering up some entity that you cannot trace through getting some kind of benefit ultimately from the success of the assets of your borrower party. Even if it's under common ownership, you probably do not have an entity that can either cross default or cross collateralize its loan obligations or could act as a guarantor. Let me give you a very simple example. But I got this recently and was able to help in five minutes and explain how we would have to do something different in the underwriting and the restructure. You had a company that was owned by five brothers. And the five brothers had a whole bunch of franchised restaurants. 
and they own them under multiple uh, entities that they all own together. They also had, as part of their structure, a, a, a couple of operational, like a management company that had a, a, a minority interest in these businesses and had an indirect uh, ownership interest up the chain of ownership. And so all of these parties could be considered potential obligors or potential guarantors of the borrower's obligations. But then these five individuals also operated a couple of completely separate businesses that were related to the restaurant business. But one was a trucking business that hauled uh, produce and other materials to the various uh, restaurants when they were purchased in bulk from distribution centers. This company, along with a similar type warehouse that would house these materials, they had no direct or indirect ownership interest in the operational side. Hence, even though they were under common ownership, we could not advise that these two standalone companies could either cross default or cross collateralize their existing loans with the company or give a guarantee of the new loans that were proposed for the various uh, restaurant operating companies. So it's very easy for us to look at an organizational chart and walk you through as to who are candidates to participate in these types of complex structures. And please, again, I urge you, if you see something like this, send me the org chart. Let me take a five-minute look. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about what you're looking Join to accomplish me. and who could be a viable party to the transaction and provide you with the underwriting and financial protections that you're looking to obtain. Finally, I'm wrapping up here and I'm getting close to the witching hour, so I want to keep true to my promise uh, to Peter uh, Wimmer. Um, we've talked about, in multiple jurisdictional situations, choice of law. Here's the key test. The key test, and, and for the lawyers in the group, you're well familiar with this, the key test is what's called the reasonable nexus. Is there some relationship between the transaction and the choice of law that makes sense? That can include the location of the collateral, the residence and the operational basis for the borrower, the principal place of their business, where the lender is located when they negotiated or will be administering the loan. So, so for example, you may have a local California office make the contact, but you may be doing all your loan administration out of St. Louis. In that instance, St. Louis as well as California could potentially at least be a potential candidate for a choice of law um, analysis. What I want to impress upon you is that when you have multiple jurisdictional issues with your parties, with your collateral, please, again, spend a couple of minutes. Let's chat through it because we will almost always, very quickly, because of the work we do in so many states, be able to advise you as to which state will be best for your procedural advantages and which state will be best for your substantive or your enforcement type issues. And in that instance, we can give you very clear and safe advice on how to structure these deals and most importantly, how to structure your documents. Because if we're choosing law from a different state to control a transaction, but the collateral is located and being pledged out of a, a, of a different state, we will want to make sure to include both the provisions that comply with the choice of law state, as well as the procedural requirements for the location of the collateral state. And you can build both of those in, and again, have your cake and eat it too. 
We also want to make, make sure that in these type of transactions, we have the borrower acknowledge this split between procedural and substantive law and agree to it expressly, as well as have them agree to what's called a forum non-convenience waiver, which essentially says, if you're going to litigate this in a jurisdiction that makes most sense because of the choice of law or the procedural law at issue, the borrower cannot seek to change the location of the litigation because the site you've selected in your documents is inconvenient to them. These waivers are upheld. These waivers are valuable. They're worth including in these type of transactions. We don't put it in our boilerplate, but we always include it when we have a multiple jurisdictional situation to protect you from delays. Sometimes you don't care where it's litigated, but the delay of a form nonconvenience motion can postpone you and delay the exercise of your remedies sometimes by up to six months or more. So it's very important to put that waiver into your documents up front so that, again, you're driving the bus in making the enforcement decisions and your borrower doesn't have tools in their tool bags to either change your plans or at least delay you in the exercise of your plans. Final thoughts. Ask good questions up front. And if you run out of good questions, Call us up and we'll give you some more questions. We'll help you figure out what your collateral mix should be, what type of liens you should be taking, what type of protections you should be adding into the documents. And we'll help you think those through up front when you're putting together your term sheets or when you're putting together your initial screening memos for your credit committee to take a look at. To the extent that you're working on an LOI or a term sheet or a loan application, some of these issues are so significant that it makes sense to at least mention them in these initial non-binding uh, uh, documents. So even though an LOI is not intended to be a binding agreement, nor is a term sheet or a loan application, it can very often be hugely valuable to mention that X will be the choice of law, that the collateral will be in various jurisdictions, and that you'll retain rights to exercise against the collateral in any, fo in any format, in any order that you deem reasonably appropriate. Simple statements like that can very often, when you're negotiating the actual loan documents, uh, give you the moral high ground when the other side said, wait a second, wait a second, I don't want to give you this form non-convenience provision. We never contemplated this. I had this happen just yesterday, and I went back to the term sheet, and I said, hey, we spelled this out in the term sheet because we knew we were going to have a multiple jurisdiction issue. And you signed the term sheet. This is not a mystery. And you had your lawyer look at the term sheet. And they, and they backed right down. They did the right thing. They backed right down. So consider some of these issues, and, and we can help you, and we ghostwrite provisions for our clients for their LOIs and term sheets, knowing that they may not turn into deals and we may never be engaged. We don't care about that. We want to help you do it right. We want to help you get it set up strong up front. So don't be shy, even though you may not be sure if a deal is going through. And I've had a couple of instances, I'm proud to say, with your bank, where we've gone far down the road and worked together and had a deal kind of crumble through no fault of the lender or the bank or the way they've behaved, but through the actions of the borrower. And we've eaten our fee. Why? Because it's the right thing to do to try to help you guys build your business. Because our helping you build your business helps us build our business, and so we invest in it to the same degree that you do. So call us if you have a question. I put in a little there. It's fun and it's free. The free part I can guarantee. The fun part, that's a matter of style and personal taste. That's the end of the presentation. 
Uh, it is 11.06. Peter, I apologize. I did go over, but in my defense, we did have a couple of uh, breaks because we had people joining and we had to take a little pause. So I will uh, plead on the mercy of the court <laughs> for me going over. Are there any questions? As I see people are leaving the meeting, are there any questions? And if you'd rather ask your question in a private setting, you may feel free to call me or email me. And as those of you who have taken me up on that in the past, I will always respond within 24 hours to any phone call or email that you send me with a question. So if this is not the right forum for you, that's fine. Choose a forum that works best, and I will always be responsive and respectful to your questions. I'm now stopping the recording, and we can handle uh, 